This is Gloria Spitia, community uh, archivist at the Austin History Center. Today is Monday, June the 24th, 2013. We're in the Holt reception room of the Austin History Center, and it is currently, uh, shoot, let's see, it is 1.55 p.m. Uh, with us today is Adela Mancias, who was a member of the Brown Berets of Austin, Texas. Adela, um, do you give me permission to uh, record this, do this all history interview on behalf of the Austin History Center? Yes. Okay. Uh, if you may, uh, if you will first of all spell your first and last name for transcription purposes. Okay. Adela is A-D-E-L-A. Mancias is M-A-N-C-I-A-S. Okay, and uh, can you tell us where were you born and just give us briefly a, a, a background about yourself? Okay, uh, I was born in Plainview, Texas, uh, that's in the Panhandle, sort of halfway between Amarillo and Lubbock. Uh, my parents were both um, from the valley, but they had wound up there uh, because of work. Uh, they were, uh, they were originally my grandfather and father were originally ranch, they worked on ranches and then farming and then um, we, we just went over there and, and, and they were working there. My dad moved around a lot. Uh, he was a welder, he became a welder and he moved around a lot and he always went to little uh, rural towns and little rural towns have little rural lines unfortunately. And um, it was always these farming towns and um, in Texas and uh, sometimes you know other states, including Kansas, but um, there was always um, something, and I couldn't ever put my finger on it. I didn't know what to call it, but you know the way teachers treated us, uh, the way sometimes other students treated us. Um, there's you know incidences where they actually said you know you can't be on this part of the playground or you can't use this equipment because this is you know for you know the white people and this is for the Mexicans and that stuff hurt uh, it hurt a lot but I I, I wasn't sure where to put it wasn't sure how to handle it you know my parents didn't talk about racism I didn't hear the word racism it was just um, so, something that that I knew. Um, was, was a way of life. And um, finally when I went to high school, it was again in a small rural town in a, sort of a southeast Texas. And as soon as I graduated, I went off to college. I didn't go to, to UT, I went to, to Texas Women's University for a year, and then I went to Southwest Texas, and then I didn't know what I wanted to do. Austin was right here, so I came here. And um, looking for, um, for something to do, I, I got a little bit into education. Then I went back to school, and I took a course, and the course was Chicano um, Chicano studies. Never heard of that. Honestly, Chicano was even a new word for me. Um, but I took that course, and oh my God, that totally, you know, uh, opened up my eyes and my brain as to who I was and what had been happening and, and what this whole you know life experience that I had up to now was. Uh, my professor was Armando Gutierrez, who was um, Rasunida, and uh, Rasunida had been going on for a few years already. Um, I mean, you know, since the, the 60s, and there had been a lot of uh, uh, organizing, and a lot had happened. And this was already in the. Um, uh, Late, later 70s, 77 was when, when this was. Um, but it all made sense, you know. Um, uh, he put a word to what I had experienced, and, and he called it racism, and he talked about all the injustices, not just, you know, you know, like what had happened to me, but what was happening, you know, like everywhere in Texas, in the Southwest, you know, the history of Texas, because that's something that I never got. The real history of Texas, you don't get everywhere, you know. It's a, it's um, there, there's a certain part of history of Texas that, that kids get in school, not not really what happened. So I had no idea. 
but um, really explosively angry because all of a sudden I understood it, I wanted to do something, I got involved, um, and I became, um, well, I started working with Rasanita, and they had a newspaper, um, uh, and that's, that's uh, where I worked um, for a couple of years, eventually, um, you know, just, just helped to put that out. And in fact, it was my work with a, with a Mar -la Gente newspaper that uh, took me to East Austin because this was a statewide newspaper, so we looked at issues that were going on all over the state. Uh, we looked at um, farm worker issues, um, um, police brutality issues, and this was a time when police brutality was blatant and it was like police murder, not just brutality. And it was all over the state. Um, there was a young boy in Dallas that had uh, been shot stealing a loaf of bread, Santos Rodriguez. There was a young man in Houston, um, I believe the name was Jose Campos Torres, and he was beaten and thrown into the um, Houston Bayou by the police. There was another young man in Odessa, and I cannot remember his name. Uh, he was also uh, killed in police brutality. In Austin, there was a lot going on. And it was, you know, it was uh, Chicanos, but it was also, you know, African Americans. It was, it was this police state mentality that we just, you know, were all kind of uh, circling, you know, the, the, the wagons with. It was like, we, we were going to do something. And um, while well, I was still working with Rasonida and, and, and uh, organizing on that level, I went to, I went to uh, East Austin and I started attending meetings because at that time, the, the berets here in Austin were not a single issue. Although police brutality was huge, um, it was also um, uh, taking care of the community and taking care of other injustices that have been going on for years. At that time, there was um, the, the boat races. That was in 1978. And um, what that was was, uh, let's see, Festival Beach. They had uh, Fiesta. Um, I can't think of the festival, but they had this festival for just like you know years and years. It was just a tradition. Um, and so they would have this festival. And part of this festival were these uh, motor boat races that they would have on the part of the lake that um, is where the, the Chicano community was. And so what that involved was people from all over, not just Austin, but all over, they would drive, you know, you know, like bumper to bumper traffic throughout all the streets in the neighborhood. They would, you know, park their cars, totally block everybody in. Uh, when it was, they'd be drinking beer, when it was over, they'd be urinating in yards, they'd be, you know, like, it was horrible. It was not a, a good home environment for anybody. And that was for, you know, uh, I think at least a couple of weekends a, a year. I'm not sure if it was one or two, but it was not a good situation. So uh, the, uh, the community people in Esau had been asking them uh, to, to stop the boat races, or at least move them. It wasn't stop them, it was move them, it was get them out of here because this is not a good, um, a good place for them. Uh, did not listen, you know, they went on and on. And, um, and so the Berets that year uh, staged a protest and um, it became very violent. The police got involved and um, they, uh, they beat up uh, several of the Beret members and uh, one woman, uh, Ana Perez in particular, she was pregnant. Um, but it, that got some publicity. And it was after that that something was done. You know, the boat races were moved. Or actually, the boat races were moved, the boat races just stopped. But it took that. It took that kind of action. It took that kind of organizing. It took that kind of determination to, uh, to make a difference. And um, I wasn't a beret at that time, but I soon became a beret after that. So it was in there, you know, Tom gets fuzzy for a bit. It was like 79, 80 that I, uh, I did become a beret. And 
um, not all parades were from the community, but a lot of them were, most of them were. And I always felt like, you know, the people that were born here and uh, lived here and had their homes here and their families here, you know, had a particular say about what, what happened and how it happened. And, um, and that, that's kind of the, 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 the way it was, that the people that were, that were native from this area were the, were, were the, were the leadership. They're the ones that, um, it, it was self-determination, really, basically, um, for, for their own community. And uh, we met with people, I mean, if you'll notice, if, if you remember the, the cities that I said there was, there was police brutality, incidents of police brutality, every one of those places also had uh, beret chapters. There was a beret chapter in Dallas that we uh, worked with, and when we had something going on, they came, the people from San Antonio, there was a beret chapter in San Antonio, and they came uh, from Lubbock. El Paso, the valley. Um, and so it wasn't just an isolated little, you know, uh, local group. It was statewide. And while there had, might have been something going on in, in California or anything like that, this was our Texas. This was, this was Texas that was, was doing this. And so we would um, often uh, have rallies. Whenever there was an incident or to bring attention to something, we, we would travel. We would go to the valley. We would go to the Dallas and support them. And, um, and that went on for, um, for, for a while. And the thing is that, as, as I mentioned before, it wasn't just issues of police brutality. The Brown Berets in, um, in this town in particular, and I'm not sure that the same thing happened in every location, but in this town, the Brown Berets were responsible for some very, very fundamental changes that happened in the East Austin neighborhood for the Mexican American uh, community. Uh, because there had been a, the whole area had been um, zoned industrial for many years, well, back in the, when there was white flight and they all left and they just zoned it all industrial and that was like in the 30s, 40s. And that's when, you know, uh, Mexican families started, you know, buying the houses and living there. But you know what, they could not uh, fix their houses because they couldn't get a loan to fix the house because they were not zoned residential and they did not give loans to uh, homes where there was only industrial. So the homes were becoming dilapidated. Uh, the young people were starting to move out, you know, and, and it was like, okay, you know, we, we gotta save this as, as, our, as our home neighborhood. And uh, that became the other, the other issue was um, uh, to work with that. And that took organizing. Because the berets, there were just a few berets. I don't know, there might have been maybe 10, I don't know, 15. But uh, we went into the neighborhood and we had meetings in people's homes and we help people become leaders we help people learn to talk in front of the city council learn the issues learn you know um, basically that they had a voice and they had a cause and that they could talk about it and they could change things and that was the main thing that you can change things and so um, there, there were several community organizations that sprung out of this um, depending on the area of the neighborhood that that, uh, that they lived in, and there were several leaders. Um, Francis Martinez was a leader, uh, Mr. Edward Rendon, um, Mr. Ramirez, uh, Frank Ramirez, um, Mr. Martinez from Rainy Street. And now that, that battle, we, we held that one off for a while, and that, that eventually, if you know anything about what's going on now, that one was lost because you know, we always knew that there was going to be gentrification. Um, and I guess we were hoping that people would just hang on to their homes and not have to sell and leave. Um, and, and that didn't happen. Although the zoning, the zoning did happen, the rezoning, it got rolled back. Uh, and that was because of um, Ramboray and neighborhood uh, efforts. 
wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, but anyway, so um, those were the cases, and I think some of the the issues or, or, or what, um, maybe not an issue, but event that uh, a lot of people remember is the Klan March. And the Klan March was also part of police brutality. That's why um, uh, we were getting together, but then the Klan came to Austin. And, uh, and they were going to have a rally. And, you know, I know all about you know, constitutional right to speak and everything, but, you know, at that time it was like, no, you know, um, these people are speaking of, well, they were anti-immigration, they were anti-Mexican, they were threatening this on TV, uh, I mean, and they, sh and they aired it on the news, so it was like, you know, we, we had an, an anti-Klan march. We went to the city council, we tried to block it that way, and, um, Needless to say, they said, no, we cannot refuse them the right to, to march. They have to march. We, you know, everybody has the right to march. So um, we did an, uh, a counter rally. And um, actually, it wasn't the Klan that attacked us. It was the police. And it was a very well-known event because it was on news nationally. Um, People that I knew in other states called me about it. And um, that became, I think, I, I, I don't know, sort of a watershed moment for everybody. Things, I, I guess because of the publicity, I, I, I'm not sure exactly um, if, it was a, if it was a turning moment. It, it seems like it was, but at that moment, um, we got a lot of publicity from everywhere, and the trial went on for, for weeks. Uh, we were arrested, three of us were arrested three weeks after the event for uh, obstructing somebody else's, or for, for interfering with somebody else's arrest. The person that got arrested was Paul Hernandez. Paul was the, um, it was a, the, uh, the leader of the, of the Berets at the time. And uh, he got severely beaten. And it was all on camera. A um, TV camera had been had gotten it from a top, from like a bird's eye view, from the top of a parking garage. And I guess that's uh, I knew I knew how the injustice. I knew everything, but I had never really seen it so close up as then in the courthouse, where um, cop after cop just came and and just lied and said, you know, they did this and they did that, and I had been there and I knew that none of that had happened. And they replayed it over and over again, and they told the jury what they were seeing, and and uh, till till the jury, after a while, it wasn't, it, they didn't think anything about this man getting beaten, held down and, and beaten, and um, they, they they got a totally different perspective of what was going on. You were there, right there, on the spot while that was going on, right? Yes. You and uh, Maria, Maria Limon. Limon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there were uh, Maria Limon and I were like uh, really flanking Paul. We were, one was on one side, and I think she was on the other side. And we were just walking along, and then uh, when they stopped us, they just started pushing us back with billy clubs, and uh, they immediately started, you know. Uh, poking him with Billy, it's not pushing him back, but poking him. And, you know, the natural thing for you to do is want to, you know, like help somebody. And that's what we were trying to do. We were just trying to help him. And um, then they turned on us and um, we, we were both uh, beaten. What, 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 uh, I know she was hit on the head, mm -hmm. uh, I believe. What were you, where were you hit? I was hit on the head, too, also. and uh, I was knocked out pretty much immediately because I know um, they hit me on the head and I went down and then the next thing I knew they were dragging me out, you know, um, uh, DPS officers were dragging me out from, from the crowd and, um, and Maria, they did not knock her out. She did not go down with the first blow, so they continued to hit her. And uh, we have video where she actually was crawling out, uh, trying to get out of there. And Paul
Paul would just stay in there and he just took the beating. And he had, you know, concussions and it took him a long time to get over that. And, tell, uh, tell me, um, because I have seen when you stood up at city council that, that day um, and uh, the vote was taken by the city councilman. Um, tell me, because you spoke, you were one of the speakers, what emotions were you feeling at that time to stand up, to say your piece, and then to have the council members uh, one voting against and the others voting for the march. What was the feeling like at that point? Um, I guess I, I could not understand why anybody, and actually now, now I do, you know, like in, in, you know, like people have to do what they have to do in the positions that they have to do. But to me at that time, it was how can you allow these people with the history that they have, with the known history, with what they have come in here into this town and said, because they actually said they held it. It was on, on, on TV. One of the clan members held up a gun and said, this is for Paul Hernandez, you know, and they, and they showed it on TV. And, and they were talking about Mexicans and they were talking about, you know, we're gonna send it right back to Mexico. And, and, it was about, and you're gonna let these people, you know, uh, march? I think just by, you know, like, they could have said, you know, they're they're um, inciting riots. They're they're you know they're they're they could have stopped them in another way. But their their position was they have a constitutional right to speak. And the person that I think I addressed um, directly was Mr. Trevino, Mr. Johnny Trevino. He was the um, the Mexican American council member, and. Uh, Mr. Trevino had been favorable, he, he tried to be favorable with us, you know, because, I mean, he knew people, he, he, he came from that community, so, you know, he, he tried to help, and I knew he was um, troubled with this, I knew he was in a terrible position, but I, I could not understand why he, why he wouldn't. Why he didn't just say, yeah, I know, it's, it, that's constitutional, but you know what, my principal belief is this, and I'm not going to vote for it. Dr. Erdy did that, I believe it was Dr. Erdy. Dr. Erdy voted against it on that principle. And so my emotions, I guess at the time, I was really um, angry and, and, and frustrated because I could understand, not really, but I mean, I could see how the other council members, you know, might be, might use that. As, as their reasoning, but I, I just couldn't see uh, Mr. Trevino because I just thought, you're one of us, you know, that threat was for you, that threat was for your family, that threat was for, you know, and um, and I didn't see it, and, and that's what was going What was the end result of the trial? I mean, what, what, what was the final result of it? Um, the final result was Maria and I were acquitted on our charges, and um, Paul was, um, he was charged with, I believe, resisting arrest. That's the only charge I remember, resisting arrest, and it might have also been, um, I, 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 don't, I don't think they could be charged with anything else except for that. and. Um, Nobody went to jail, nobody, and, and we did try and go on a, a civil, um, for civil rights suit, and um, did not get that. And I think today, if that happened today, it would be different. Because Rodney, what happened was Rodney came just a few years later, no different. Yeah. That maybe, you know, the only difference was that he was a single person, and here it was, you know, like three people that got beaten up. Very, very publicly. All the, you know, news coverage that you could want. But um, it didn't happen here. There were a lot of people that were participating in the march against uh, during that, that, at that day, on that day, right? Uh, you mean it was anti at, at the anti, anti uh-huh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it wasn't 
just you know Mexican Americans. It was you know African Americans. It was a Black Citizens Task Force. It was uh, several um, very progressive uh, organizations of students and you know other other political organizations. And you know um, people that just came, people in Austin that just came to protest. It was it was big. Uh, let's go back to when you were involved with the uh, newspaper Para La Gente. Uh, Silvio Orozco, Cynthia Orozco, and some of the other individuals of, with La Raza Unida Party. Um, were you learning, were, who else from the Brown Berets, were there any other individuals in the Brown Beret movement at the time that were also involved with that paper and with uh, La Raza Unida Party at the same time? Um, not directly. Uh, not that we're part of the Brown Berets. Now, there were some people uh, very active in East Austin. Marcos de Leon and Hortensia Palomares uh, were also, had also been students at UT. And they were also, you know, had been working um, at, to some level, and I'm not real sure because I didn't know them that well at that time with uh, Rasanina, but it was, um, it was two separate things. It was two separate things, and there wasn't a whole lot of overlap. Um, there tends to be some turfdom, and I think, my personal opinion, was that, you know, Rasanina was about organizing. Okay, there's a need here, let's go organize. And then there was East Austin that was saying, hey, we got leadership. We're already organized. We're working on it. You know, we don't need, you know, that. And there's always, you know, there's always those rifts and those things. And, and so I, I don't think that there was a lot of going back and forth. I sort of just, after a while, I just went ahead and, uh, and started working more directly with the East Austin community and eventually with the Brown Berets. How did y'all manage? If you can just tell us, how did y'all manage the Brown Berets, if there were a few, you know, not that many members, uh, to get the community to support, to find their voice, if you will? How did y'all do that? That's a good question. Um, I think, I think the people that found their voice, some of them, some of them came out when Paul got beaten up. Mr. Rendon, who was uh, a, a, a very strong leader at high school, I believe, the area he lived in, he was with these town like citizens, very strong leader, that brought him out. That brought him out when, um, you know, he saw it on TV. He saw they were beating up Paul and Sam uh, Hernandez and, you know, and, uh, Bosco, they were arresting him, and they had beaten up Alma, and, and uh, he came out and he said, this isn't right, you know, this isn't right, and, you know, they're doing this for our community, and, you know, and so he got involved, and he, and he was there for years and years and years. Same thing with, with Mr. Martinez. Mr. Martinez was a very soft-spoken man, but saw things very clearly. And uh, he had his little house on Rainy Street, and he saw the writing on the wall. And we had been working on Rainy Street, going door to door, you know, talking about, you know, this is, you know, there's this meeting going on, you know, we're going to be talking about rollback zoning, we're going to be talking about protecting the neighborhood, we're going to be talking about not bringing in this development or that development. It was always something. And Mr. Martinez, you know, uh, so we would have meetings. We would find someone to have a meeting in, in their home. And he came, and he got, from the minute he got involved, he became the leader for that neighborhood, the Rainy Street neighborhood. And uh, when people became leaders for their own area, like Mr. Rendon, he organized people in his area, you know, that whole uh, uh, Haskell Street, that, that area. Mr. Ramirez came in, too, for the same reason. He just saw, you know, it made sense, you know, and, and he saw that, you know, that it was for the good of everybody. He came in and he started organizing that area as well. Francis Martinez, Barrio Nido was her area. Um, they just saw, they saw the energy, they felt the energy, they saw that things were getting done, 
they heard each other on TV, you know, like talking to, you know, like when had people, you know, from the community come and addressed the council and, you know, directly and told them, look, you know, like, you know, this is what we want, this is what we don't want, you know, we have this right, you know, we have, we, and, um, and we would pack the council chambers, we would pack them. And that's back then before they've had like these time limits, you know, where after you, after a certain time, you know, they don't have any more meetings. We stayed for more than one occasion. We stayed till one or two in the morning talking, and people would stay. And you know, uh, people from the community would get up on the podium. They had never spoken publicly, and they would, and they talk sometimes in Spanish, and they had translators. But um, it was the, it was that initial energy, it was like, wow, you know, we have this, you know, this ability, this power to do this. And, uh, and it went on for several years. There was an East Town Lake Citizens, and then there was, um, let's see, Barrio Nido, Rainy Street, oh, and then there was Go Valley, the Go Valley uh, Neighborhood Association. And there was another um, very, very strong leader there. Uh, I'll think of her name in a minute. But, but it was, that, that, that's what did it. It wasn't just our organization for Paul. It was, you struck a match and it energized, you know, everything. Yeah. And then they did their own organizing. And what we would do, um, is we would go to their houses when they were having a meeting, a neighborhood meeting, and we would help them with the facts. We would help them, you know, like, you know, they they had the passion. They could talk, you know, to their neighbors and their, you know, their relatives and, you know, they brought in. And, you know, we had the ability to go, you know, do research and bring in, you know, numbers and bring in, you know, like backup information because it wasn't just, I mean, it was, um, it was scientific. It was, you know, we weren't just, you know, throwing out, um, you know, just, just random information. Well, y'all were producing documents. We did, and we were researching history. Yeah. And we were researching uh, projects that had been proposed for the area using government money, uh, suggesting that, because at the time there was, um, there were these grants that the government would give for developing in a poor neighborhood. So what they would do, would develop a particular that got money, was downtown, but they were able to say, oh, it's part of this neighborhood because it's so close to downtown. So they got money for a hotel from the government. And those things were what we exposed. And you know, and, um, and yeah, we, had, we, had, we did a lot of the research ourselves and we had people helping us with research. It was, um, it was really, really put together. We, we you know, we, we knew what we were doing, be obviously because we brought about change. Yeah. And if anything goes down in the history of this organization, as far as what has, what, what part it played in Austin, is that it did change um, a lot of the zoning, it changed people's attitudes about their homes, it changed a, um, it changed, um, an attitude with the police department. I mean, it took a couple of police chiefs, but that had already been exposed, and that was never going to happen again without having a huge backlash. What was, what would you say of everything that the Brown Berets were involved in? Is there something that stands in your mind that would not have been accomplished had it not been for the Brown Berets? Is there anything? Yeah, those, those two uh, things that I mentioned mostly is the um, changing of uh, overseeing police activity because our protests, our actions, our voices, and bringing in the community with us because it wasn't just us. We had people with us. Um, they initiated a review board you know, uh, that came from that. That came from that, from those actions. It came from us uh, staging a protest in front of the police department, you know, day after day after day after day, and like for 
for weeks, somebody was out there. Sometimes it might be one or two people, but somebody was out there with a sign um, every day for weeks and weeks. So that brought some change, some permanent change, and, uh, and the way that things are done. And, uh, and the other one is that old time building, because that community is different. And I, I drive through there now, and I see all the little, you know, um, townhouses and mansions, and I go, had we not done this, had we not done this, um, you know, uh, it might have not been gentrified. But it was, uh, this gave people an opportunity to be able to stay more than it would have in the first place, because some people were able to fix their homes and to and to um, and, and to stay there and to have their children want to stay there. One of those streets was Third Street, was it not? Or is it yeah? Sure, Third Street, Street. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, tell me, because there's a in David Montejano's book, um, he mentions that of course there were very you know there were few members, but on, he makes a comparison with the Austin Brown Parades and San Antonio and some of the other chapters in Texas. But in, as far as the Brown Parades in Austin, he says, y'all were very active. And he puts it into three categories and then he says, okay, San Antonio, they were doing this and they were doing this, but they didn't, you know, mm -hmm. do the three things. Mm -hmm. um, again, that had to have been a lot of work for y'all to be doing. Uh, and at that time, uh, how many of the members at the time also had family members that were part of the Brown Berets? Mm. Um, well, so, uh, just about everybody, I would say, um, had another member like, okay, well, Paul, uh, his brother Sam were both uh, uh, members and leaders. Um, Let's see, Alma Perez was not from Austin. She did not have uh, any relatives in here. Um, my brother was in the Berets, and he, um, his wife was, uh, she actually lived on Rainy Street. And the, the Beret wedding uh, was uh, theirs. It was in the back of um, uh, Crystal Mendes' house, you know, who was my brother's wife which is now the Luster Pearl Bar. But uh, that's, that's where they got married. And Elias uh, Mendes and his wife, um, there was um, uh, Alfredo Rangel or Vasco, and um, his brother-in-law, Zico Bayou, uh, was a beret. Zeke is now uh, living somewhere else, but he was one of the original rights that was here. Um, let me see who else was like that had relations. Well, you know, um, just people that were involved with, with, with each other, you know. But, but as far as like familiar relationships, that was. Yeah. yeah. And that made it sort of a little bit easier, also, I guess, to be able to get more unified because it was within the family. It was within to say, okay, well, you're living in the same home or have contact with them. Mm -hmm. um, let's go back because uh, the, uh, the Brown Beret wedding is very much of interest to me and I am looking for photographs on that. But can you describe the wedding? Do you remember the wedding? My memory gets fuzzy on some things, but I do remember it was outside. Um, it was, um, we had a table with food, <laughs> this was really funny, we had a table with food, and you know, uh, they were they were like together in the front, and we were sort of on the, on the side, and I remember there were ants <laughs> next, so we started like, we started just like kicking them off and, and doing a little stomp, looked like a little dance. Um, I don't remember, I'm sorry, I do not remember any of the words that were said, but it was, um, a, um, I'm, I'm pledging my life to you and to the cause and for our children, you know, and, and, and that, that sort of tone. Um, I wouldn't 
call it so much as militant as just very committed to um, to the future of protecting, you know, uh, family and community. And that was on Rainy Street also? Mm -hmm. It was on Rainy Street. I wonder if anybody has thought about putting that as part of the history of that Rainy Street, you know, Robert. that might be, <laughs> well, you know, that's, they're going back to that time period, so that could very well be. Um, okay, now let's talk about uh, another thing is after the Brown Berets, now, well, let's just say, do you remember why the Brown Berets ceased? I mean, what was the decision to just stop while well, other chapters still continued? Well, uh, again, it's always from my perspective because everybody's right. looking at this from different right. viewpoints. And somebody may see things that I didn't see or see things in a different way than what I saw. From what, from what I saw, it started, it, it, it was a slow thing. It wasn't just like real sudden. It was a slow thing. It was, um, I think, um, differences in some of the decisions that were made. Some of the, some of the leadership was, you know, this is, you know, um, this is the way it is and uh, other people disagreed with that, and I think I'll be more specific. Uh, there was one issue in particular. It was a um, health clinic. There had already been, uh, so some of the people were, were, were um, troubled by one person being the just elevated leader and you know, spokesperson, especially when they didn't agree with everything that he said. And so there started to be some rift there. But then there was one issue in particular. It was a, uh, a clinic, a, a clinic that was proposed for real close to Rainy Street. It was like right across where, where um, there's still some buildings there. There's like a, I think it's like where the taxi shop, I mean the taxi, office was. There was like a little triangle there. And there was a, a woman who had had a child care center running it here uh, in the community. I had worked with her. And uh, she was working with children, um, you, you, children in poverty and you know, with nutrition and parenting and, and that sort of thing. And she was heading, she wanted, she wanted to put daycare in that area. She wanted to, because she had to move from her area, she wanted to put a daycare that just helping children to grow up and a clinic. And um, she went ahead, spearheaded it. She was always real careful to come and tell the community, look, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, you know. But because I think she was seen um, as maybe, I don't know if I told you about turfdom, mm -hmm. as, oh, you know, and she was strong. She wanted that clinic there and she wanted that daycare there because you know, she had tried to find other places and she, she believed in what she needed, you know, what, what she thought that people needed. And so, and people around there were fine with it. But um, this is where there was a split. Paul and you know, some other berets were against the clinic. And there were other berets that were for the clinic. And that was just sort of like a, a was that the initial chisel that started, you know, and um, and then it just started, you know, different issues, and um, and then some people fell away from it, and there were other other issues going on because I think this is true of any organization, you know, uh, especially when when you're coming together from very, very, very grassroots or very, um, you, can be a, you can be a great leader and you can have great flaws, you know, and that's just the way it is. And a lot of the people, there were, there were complaints about you know, some of the um, 
the berets, from some of the women that were not berets, but you know, working with the berets, there were complaints about um, sexism, and um, and they didn't, you know, um, and and so some of that support started, you know, chipping away, and it's like you know when things get done and things, and people just kind of sit back and start kind of like. It's like sort of like I guess like family when you live with them for a while, you start seeing the flaws. Yeah. It's like oh, I don't really like that. And you know when it was just issues, it was like yes, we all want the same thing, you know. And then you go and you fight, and you know, and you're there, and and it went on for a long time. And then um, when we won those things, and we were just kind of sitting back and going, okay, so now we fought and we won. One thing I didn't tell you was. Um, Another big thing that happened with the Marines was they wrote a for a grant and they got um, quite a bit of money. I don't even remember how much money it was, but for, especially for that time, it's quite a bit of money. So that they set up uh, it was called the East Austin Chicano Economic Development Corporation, and it was they set up a revolving fund. Sorry, it was ten thousand dollars, and this corporation was made up of people, you know, that were supposed to be um, of the same mindset as the community, as a race, but they had professional um, backgrounds that would help them in their position. There was a housing person to help with housing. There was, oh, what were some of the other positions? There was housing, there was, I honestly can't remember everybody else. Um, but all the, 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 there were like four or five positions that were paid through, and Paul was the director. And I think that that's kind of when people started going, okay, this, you know, saying back now, what is this becoming? You know, how is this going to? And and that money, I know for sure that that money went, every bit of it went to help people with loans for their homes, because uh, it wasn't that much money. And as soon as people knew that there was money, you know, to, for, to loan them for, they went and they, you know, they needed this, for, you know, to fix their house, or they needed that, or they needed, and the money just went out. What didn't, I, I guess it was, like, you know, again, management skills. It didn't come back. It was supposed to be a revolving loan where they put it back. But you know, lack of experience, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that happens, you know, when you, when you're new, yeah. when you're starting, and those things, you know, and all that played a part in the Marais sort of came together very, very, you know, volatilely. It was just, and it was explosive. A lot of change came out of it. And then, and that's sort of, that's sort of like a natural, um, the natural cycle of a revolution. And this was like, like a mini revolution, if you, if you will. I, I really see it as that because it, it brought about change, you know, and then, you know, it, it, it kept going, but then when revolutionaries try to govern, it's a it's different, different thing, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And I think with the East Austin Chicano Economic Development Corporation, it was more, okay, they weren't so much fighting as trying to develop. And there were um, that same passion that had been there before didn't keep some of those people in the organization and they kind of started splitting up and going, well, I don't agree with you for this and, you know, I'm going to go this and, you know, and, and I'm tired of this and I'm tired of and, and it happened. Every one of them good people. Every one of them a good heart. Every one of them wanting the best for everything. But clashing with other members and when you clash with other members, the organization, I think one of the things that I have seen as I work on this project is that one, the individuals when they first started the Brown Berets here, they were all young. They were all young. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is what amazes me, you know, is that they were doing so much. I think in a way they were doing much more than some of the elected uh, officials. Absolutely. And then as time went by, because they were, again, as you said, is they were giving the voices to the people in the community. And as they, and they became their friends. They got a real close relationship. Because after all, these individuals, uh, they would march alongside them. 
or anything that they needed to be, you know, to be done and so forth. Another thing, too, and we go back to 1983 with the march of the KKK, along with that, the demolition of White as Lincoln. And so all of that is coming along. And then money becomes available. But it is hard. When you loan money to a friend or to a family member, it is very hard for you to go back to them and say, you know, I need you to pay me. I need to get this. Right. And a lot of individuals also um, were not that well established in Austin, the ones that were with those that were supposed to have been knowledgeable, I guess, if you consider that, the professionals in some way. So they were trying to find themselves. Mm -hmm. And so all of that comes along. Again, when you get a grant, you've got to be sure that you're keeping records. You've got to do all of this. And again, these individuals were not, you know, the lawyers and all of the accountants that had all of that experience. And you're having to deal also with the city. You're having to deal with the federal government. You're having to deal with all of that other. And so you're sort of being pulled in all directions. And that, you're absolutely right about all of that. Um, and the people that were hired for uh, the East Sausage Economic Development Corporation, the people that were hired did have um, those administrative backgrounds or experiences. However, they were working sort of like for, you know, um, people that did not really um, believe in doing things, you know, status quo, the way that they'd always been done. And it was all about change. And yet, you kind of needed some of the, the skills that these people had to, to make it run right and be able to, to do things so that it would, you know, it would continue to be successful because it, it has to fit in, in this. It, it, it was like something that didn't fit into the bigger picture. And in order to make it fit into the bigger picture, it would have to change in some fundamental ways. And there was resist for that, resistance to that change. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, um, you know, it's it, just something that in time. And that happens. Mm -hmm. You know, you see that in so many organizations. That happens a lot. Now, let's talk about you. After the Brown Berets, uh, you get your degree, uh, and in, so in what? In education. Um, I, after trying a lot of different things, I really knew that I wanted to go into education for the same thing. Um, because after I, I worked, I, I was part of the Brown Berets, it was really, really clear to me um, that the only way that we can really change is to have people understand, you know, um, their world, because that's that's what I what it took for me to understand your world, to be able to make sense of who you are, uh, be able to uh, to make a good living, be able to be comfortable, be able to provide for your family, be able to do. You know, that ultimately, to me, is um, the right that everybody has. And yet, you cannot do that if you do not get a good job, because you can't read, because... And um, I saw an article in the paper today. It's still, it's still, still the biggest issue. It's like, you know, um, poverty, schools in poverty are still the lowest performing. Lowest, yeah. They're the lowest performing. And so that's, that became my life. You know, so I'm just going to work, and I've never worked at anything but a social, well, social economic school. I've always worked with um, uh, children, you know, parents, you know, don't have don't have the means, and have not had a head start with reading, you know, and come to school and they're already behind, you know, and, and now with all the testing, you know, and I'm not going to get into that. That's a whole other thing, but um, our kids. You know, um, we, we need to, every one of us, and, and I'm only one person, but the way I see it is, is this, is, this is what my life work is, is I go in and I, one, yes, I, I, I work to help them become good readers. I'm a reading specialist, 
that's, I, I feel like if a kid can learn to read, you know, the rest is possible. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm a reading specialist and that's what I've been doing for years. So I work with that. But then, you know, and I, I feel that my responsibility isn't just to teach children to read. It's like, if a child comes, you know, crosses my path in my life for as short a time as it is, you know, I, I try to, you know, to work with them to, to like, who they are, uh, what they have to, what they have to, uh, to offer, what they can achieve. Every little seed that you put in a child, you never know. You never know. I have had children today from a time when I, I've been teaching now for, because I would get in and out. Uh, I, I always had that in mind, but I would get in and out. Um, but I've had kids from, you know, like 20, 25 years ago say, this is you know. Um, you know, I remember you, you know, seven. I've had kids, you know, that bring me their grandchildren now, you know. And and so I, I, I feel like I've touched some lives, and that's what I really wanted to do. Another thing that I did um, on the way over here is I did five years of documentary work. I worked uh, with Hector Galan um, doing, um, well, we did about three of those were for Frontline. And I loved that job because, again, it was change. It was creating change. It, that was after I left the Berets as well. I left the Berets, I, I became a, uh, like a social worker for one year, and then I went and did this film work. Um, and it was the most exciting work. I would just go in, find the story. The first one was the drug war. Uh, in Dallas, and it was when crack cocaine had just hit, you know, like, it was just starting to hit, it was in 87, and uh, we decided to do it there, and then another one was on uh, Chicanas and AIDS, and another one was on farm workers, it was a follow-up from Edward R. Burroughs' um, uh, Harvest of Shame, and then we did another one, and, and that was just really, really wonderful. I learned a lot. I just, uh, I got married and I couldn't be gone for six months out of the year. Didn't you produce a children's program or something? What, what were you doing with, was it a public access TV? Yeah, or? I, did, I did a lot of public access as well. I guess media is sort of like my, my thing too. Um, with my friend Sharon um, at the time, um, Sharon Sharp, um, she, was, uh, she was Sharon Stewart at the time, and she's now. Um, and she lives in Louisiana now, but we both, we co-produced a show on ACTV, and it was, um, I think that one was called, what was that? I don't want to say Gus got on this, but it, no, 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 that, that, that was wasn't. Gus, no, it wasn't that one. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was, uh, we, we, would in, we would interview people coming to town, it was all mm -hmm. issues related. Um, a lot of people, like Native Americans, you know, we would help them to air their issues, whatever their issues they were working on. People from Mexico, like the uh, union workers from Mexico that had, you know, some going, we, they, we interviewed them. Um, Let the people speak? No? No. No. Okay. You know, getting my news except I want to say it was Para La Gente, but Para La Gente was a newspaper. I've seen it. I've seen it. <laughs> I, I know what you're talking about. I know. But. I can't believe I it's slipping my mind. But did that for for a while, and um, and we would just set up. It was real, real rogue. And we would just like you know get a camera, set it up, and like somebody would say, Raúl Salinas. I don't know if you know who Raúl mm -hmm. Salinas. Is. Well, he would always call and say, you know, uh, listen, there's you know, there's this like you know. Indian brother coming in from here or there, you know, you know, let's get the camera. And so we would we'd get the camera and, and talk about, you know, Leonard Peltier, you know. Uh, we interviewed, um, uh, I'll, I'll start with the names and I'll start forgetting. But that, that's the kind of issue we did. And they were, they were issues, they were like global, but local. It was about self-determination. It was about um, uh, education. It was about 
civil rights. It was about women's rights and women's issues and land issues. And um, so we brought that in, and, and that was a way of letting you know our community know that we had these issues, but we're connected to a you know a bigger world out there that had the same type of issues and you know. Yeah, it's um, it, it's amazing how you've been doing all of this at a time when, right after you know you've been very much an activist uh, at a young age, then you go into and you pursue that education and teach education, and still continue to be involved. Um, what? It was the role of Latinas, and I'll say Latinas, uh, or Mexican American women in the Brown Berets at the time. Were you able to do things like what you, you were talking about with education and everything? Sort of had your own little group of women that were so involved with children, because that is the one thing also that I see in a lot of photographs is that there will always be children around. Um, it, 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 regardless, in the photographs, there's always children. Uh, were y'all able to do things like that? We um, we had a vision to do that when we tried. Uh, we uh, a couple was Joanne, I believe it was Joanne Salas. Um, we actually we talked about doing an escuelita, and it was helping working with uh, children like from our own families, from our, because we had a lot of young children around. I mean, it wasn't just like, it wasn't neighborhood kids, it was kids from people in the breaks. And, um, it, you know, opening it up to other children, like we did just publicizing and saying, on Saturday we're gonna do this, we, we had little classes. And um, I, I didn't want to make it like a school, although I wanted, you know, to help kids that were uh, like behind in school. But it was a lot of um, exposure, like we would read them stories, uh, we would do games, we would... Uh, it was mostly just, uh, again, to, to give them that exposure to uh, what we were doing, how it impacted them, what, you know... Again, you have a role, you have a place, you, you know, you're part of this and you can... You know, you can do this. It's it's um, children lose their their, their self determination and their power so young. You know, they lose it either because nobody ever um, cultivates it, helps them helps them to know that they have it, or it gets um, it gets blown out in them. It just has to. so it's really important, I think, to to. Um, give children this whenever you can. And that's what we tried to do. We did not maintain it for very long. Um, and it was, again, too much coordination. Uh, we had the paper going. We had, um, we had La Contenta going. And, and then we turned it into El Aviso. We said El Aviso. And so, and I mean, that just took time. I mean, you, know, you tried to spread yourself real thin. So we, we, we knew what we needed, and we needed, the, we needed media, we needed a newspaper, we needed to inform people, we needed to, um, to help our youth so that we could bring them up at the same time. We needed economic you know, um, stimulation and development to make it all worth it. But with the resources and the time, and, you know, and, and it's like it was here, but we, we, we could not pull it together. Was there anything, we're getting ready now to sort of end, mm -hmm. um, but was there anything in your mind, in your own personal opinion, that you wish that the Brown Berets could have done that they were not able to do? Is there anything that they could have done for the community that you think might have been successful? I guess I wish that um, that it hadn't become a splintered group as it is now, because um, I, I wish that you know they had stayed together. Everybody that worked hard 
And uh, there's a lot of people, really smart people, men and women, you know, that worked really hard to, to do, to accomplish what was accomplished. Uh, and as you mentioned before, it kind of like splits more. You know, it's split up and, and uh, people are doing sort of their own things. I'm doing what I'm doing, you know. Paul's doing what he's doing, you know. Gilbert's doing what he's doing, you know. Sam and Joanne, everybody's kind of like, Angie's doing something. And we're all doing, you know, good things, but we don't ever get together and go, you know, this is what we accomplished. This is what came out of it. You know, it may not be going on right now, but we did it. We made it happen. And it happened, you know, because of, you know, something that we were able to do. And we don't do that because we're... You think that that might change in October when we do this photo exhibit and we do some of these programs, do you think there will be some that might come forward and say, you know, uh, I'm ready to, to go back and again reminisce of the past and maybe get a photo op out of all of this, everyone? I hope so and I think it depends on how everybody sees it what everybody's perception is of it, you know, yeah. how it's like, you know, like whenever you have uh, an exhibit and a presentation, it, um, it, it affects you, you know, in your own personal life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it can be good or it can be, you know, it, it, it depends. And I think it'll depend on how people are affected by it. And hopefully that, you know, they can, they can see what, what, I'm hoping to see is what I said is that this was an organization that through everybody's efforts and you know and, and people's leadership and people's courage and people's you know love for their community and their people came together and in spite of all odds because this is a very you know you may seem progressive there's a kind of a very and it was even back then more, you know, it's kind of like racist, blue blood, and you're up against it. And they, they, and they, you know, we did it. Well, that's the whole thing. Um, and that's why activism in the Brown Berets, Boston and Travis County, is the title of this project. But that is the one thing that I saw, or I've seen as I, as we collect all of this information and all. But the fact, that everyone started very young. And at the end, today, as we're here, as you said, everyone's gone in their different directions, but, I mean, you've got a dean of student services in California. You have a newspaper publisher and very active in Waco. You have an environment, environmentalist. Uh, you have a teacher, an educator, I mean, numerous educators. Uh, you have individuals that still take so much pride in their community that I don't think a day goes by that they're not doing something, you know? And so, and this, I think, brings back, or at least I hope that in a way it will bring back this pride that they were able to accomplish something. And it started it at a very young age. But at the same time that this is going to be documented so that future students from the University of Texas or St. Edwards or ACC, when they come here to the Austin History Center, at least they will have been able to find more information. And they can document that in their papers, whether it be a thesis, a dissertation, or whatever, or even for those researchers that hopefully will decide to write a book. Um, that's why videotaping, that's why, you know, doing the digital recording and all. But it is amazing how so much was accomplished within 10 years. And it changed the course. And it changed the course. It changed the course for, um, for this town. And it's an important town, and it was an important part of history. Very much so. So, so I think that that is, you know, um, the biggest. It changed the course for in a good way. Yeah. Is there anything 
that you want to say before we end this interview? No. Um, I thank you for the opportunity. It's been cathartic, sort of, for me to talk about it. Well, you know, that's the same thing that I was told when we did the uh, Emma Barrientos Mexican American uh, Cultural Arts Center uh, Oral History Project. And one of the individuals that, in the, that was on the panel said, you know, I wasn't going to participate at the end. She had decided that maybe she wasn't going to participate on the panel. But then she did. And she said, you know, it was very therapeutic for her. Very therapeutic. She was glad that she did it. So um, this is the one thing that I'm so happy that I am able to call on individuals like yourself who are willing to, you know, uh, document this for future generations mm -hmm. and uh, for others. And now, um, I mean, the paper mount is growing as we recover this history. Mm -hmm. And this is what the intention is, is to recover this history and to reclaim it. Reclaim it in the, for the Brown Berets, reclaim it for those that work so hard, um, whether they be members or individuals from the community that were very active. Because that is another thing that people don't realize. In doing the, the MAC Oral History Project, individuals like Francis Martinez, Rowan Salinas, you know, other individuals, Vilda Ruiz, uh, they remember fondly of the Brown Berets. They remember marching alongside them um, and if everything that they did for them. Uh, and so that is another thing, is when you hear these individuals, they were not members of the Brown Berets, but were members of the community, then you know. And so that is, that's another thing too that I, you put all of that together when you have two projects and both are related to one another somewhat. Uh, that is another thing. So I, I do thank you for allowing me to, to document this. And uh, also, uh, I am looking forward to October. I hope that we will do this project and the programs that we uh, will have uh, uh, be doing in October uh, justice as, you know, what the Brown Berets were able to uh, also uh, have justice at the end of everything else. So thank you very much. Thank you.